Today I want to talk to you about marriage. I'd like to take some questions afterwards, so if you think of something while I'm talking, just jot it down and you can ask it. I'm not sure when the shift began, maybe with the show Stepford Wives or Married with Children, uh, but like a tsunami of epic proportions is the only way I can describe the recent onslaught of negativity resounding uh, re around marriage. Wives are miserable, husbands cheat, marriages don't last. That message is on full display in TV shows and movies. Desperate housewives, basketball wives, the real housewives fill in the name of the city. These shows describe an unbelievably sad picture of marriage. A lady wrote into advice columnist, Dear Abby, she said, you said at the bottom of your column, how has the world been treating you? Unload your problems on Dear Abby. As soon as I find a crate large enough, I'm sending you my husband. <laughs> Is it possible to have a good marriage? Since God created marriage in the beginning, it has been the closest relationship into which two people can enter. But it has always been filled with challenges. A woman died and went to the pearly gates and she was met by St. Peter and she says, can I come into heaven? He said, not yet. He said, you have to spell a word. She said, what word? Any word. She said, love, L-O-V-E. He said, come on in. Then Peter excused himself and he says, could you kind of hold my post here for a while? And she said, well, what do I do? And he says, just follow the same procedure I used with you. A couple minutes later, her ex-husband came up the hill. She said, what are you doing here? He said, I got a heart attack and uh, here I am. Did I make it to heaven? She says, not yet. You have to spell a word. He said, what word? She thought for a minute. She said, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <clears throat> Marriage is the most fulfilling relationship on earth, but it is also the most challenging. What are the keys to marriage? Uh, this message is for marrieds, soon to be marrieds, uh, teenagers, singles. Uh, single people cannot live their lives well, a balanced life, and, unless they have a balanced, informed view of marriage. Otherwise, they will over desire marriage or under desire marriage. And either way, it will distort their lives. This is a sixth in a series of messages called Standing Firm in Hard Times. We all face hard times at some time. Peter is writing to first century Christians who were facing unbelievable persecution under Emperor Nero in Rome. And the people would say to Peter, should we tell other people we're Christians? I mean, is it smart? I mean, would you just lose our jobs and be persecuted? Maybe we'll be killed? And some would say to him, you know, of all the pressure I face as a Christian, one of the toughest things I deal with is my own marriage. So Peter addresses it in 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7. If you'd like to follow along with me in the Bible underneath the seat in front of you, it's on page 1222. These seven verses, what I got out of it was the key to a great marriage is a right attitude towards your mate. What should that attitude be? Although Peter gives husbands and wives different instructions, the attitude is the same for both. His instructions to both wives and husbands begin with the same words. In the same way. What's he talking about? He's referring back to the attitude of Jesus Christ. Chapter 221, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should fall in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Husbands and wives are, have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. When he was falsely accused, when he was spit upon, when he was beaten, when he was crucified, he did not fight back. He did not retaliate. He did not threaten. He came to die for you and me. So that's what he did. He served us. The right attitude to bring to marriage is to see marriage as the place where we learn to serve another person's needs ahead of our own, just like Jesus did. Husbands and wives must serve each other. They must give themselves up 
for each other. You put the happiness of your spouse ahead of your own, just as Jesus did. The right attitude is to give yourself up. You stop making excuses for your selfishness. You say, I'm not selfish. Well, if somebody takes a picture, their iPhone, and, uh, and, you, and you look at it, what's the first person you look for in that picture? And if you like the picture of yourself, you say, that's a good picture, post it. We're all that way. The right attitude is to treat your selfishness as the number one problem in your marriage. I'm confident that my selfishness is the number one problem in my marriage. Apostle Paul says, And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. There is the classic definition of sin. The beginning of sin is living for ourselves, living self-centeredly. If two spouses each say, I'm going to treat my self-centeredness as the main problem in the marriage, you have every hope of cultivating a beautiful marriage. Through my marriage with Jory, I have been brought face to face with my self-centeredness again and again. But you must realize that it is ultimately not your spouse who is exposing the selfishness of your heart. It is marriage itself. Marriage does not so much bring you into confrontation with your mate, but it brings you into a confrontation with yourself. Marriage gives you a realistic, unflattering picture of yourself. Then it takes you by the scruff and has you deal with it. Tim Keller, in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, describes marriage as an old bridge going over a stream. He says the old bridge may have some imperfections in it, and an engineer would be able to see those hairline fractures. But to the naked eye, the bridge looks perfectly fine. But then have a 10-ton truck drive on that bridge, and suddenly all those hairline fractures become visible for all to see. The truck did not create the fractures. It just revealed them. In marriage, your mate is like a big truck that drives right through your heart. Your mate does not cause your problems. The mate just reveals them. You may want to blame your mate for your blow-ups, but it's marriage itself that brings to surface your imperfections. But that's not all a bad thing, to have your mate showing up your, your, your flaws. How can you become all God, God wants you to be if you think you're perfect? Marriage shows you you're not. The right attitude toward your mate is to give up your self-centeredness so that you can serve your spouse. Now, Peter talks to wives and husbands. He starts with the wives. A wife must cultivate an attitude of submission toward her husband. Verse 1, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your husbands. Now, the skeptic, the critical, said, there, there it is. Christianity is anti-women. Tells wives to submit to their husbands. Can you believe that? She's going to have to do whatever he says. But actually, this command shows quite the contrary. When Peter wrote to the first century Christians, he was writing to a patriarchal society where women had no rights. They couldn't even testify in a court of law. They had to do what their husband told them to do. So the very fact that he tells wives to submit tells you that in their new found faith in Christ, they realized that they had been freed, that women are equal with men. They stand equal before God through Jesus Christ with their husbands. And Peter says, don't now walk out on your husband. Don't blow the whole marriage up. Voluntarily submit to your husband. Husbands like to lead. Let them do that. Verse 1, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. He gives the reason. So that your non-believing husband might come to follow Christ. Remember now, this is first-generation Christianity. So we have a family where the wife, maybe, has put her faith in Christ, but the husband has not. 
You have another marriage where the husband has committed his life to Christ, but the wife has not. Or maybe uh, the son in the family has become a Christian, but the rest of the family is not. He says, wives, you've given your lives to Christ. Live in this way so that you might win your husband without a word. Verse 2, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. The husband sees the change in his wife and says, what has happened? You say, if she's going to submit to him, won't she get walked on? No, Peter says quite the opposite. She will have more influence. She will win her husband. Second thing we find, a wife should pursue inner beauty over external beauty. Verse 3, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Here we see a clear difference between men and women. Some people like to say there's, no really, there's not really any difference. I mean, a husband and wife go to Gap to buy a pair of jeans. The husband takes six minutes, pays $39, he's back out in the car. The wife takes three hours and 43 minutes, pays $876, and she doesn't ever get to Gap. Verse 3, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. Like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham, called him her Lord, you are her daughters if you do what is right, and do not give way to fear. Peter is not degrading the importance of external beauty. The person he chooses as an example, Sarah, was a dazzling beauty. In Genesis 12, we read that at age 65, Pharaoh picked her. She was gorgeous. Outward beauty is not unimportant, but Peter says, but even more important is inner beauty. I consider my wife beautiful, but I am certain that part of her beauty comes from her inner part, her thoughtfulness, her sensitivity, her kindness, her purity. Ladies, I believe you're being sold a cheap substitute. You're being told that what matters is how much money you have and uh, how, you know, what, how nice the clothes you wear and hairstyles you have and jewelry you wear. The even reason the average woman would rather have beauty than brains is because she realizes the average man can see better than he can think. <laughs> God says, be more concerned with internal beauty. Focus on developing a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great importance to God. Peter's on to something. When a woman is free from bitterness and resentment and anger, She's far more beautiful on the outside. Now Peter turns to husbands. A husband must cultivate an attitude of love for his wife. Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then he concludes that famous passage in verse 33, However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Isn't that interesting? He says husbands are to love their wives, and wives are to respect their husbands. Why didn't he just say, hey, love each other, and it all will be great? It's because he realizes that the number one need of a wife is to be loved. But even more important to the husband than love is to be respected. And so each are to give these. Do you know the number one felt need of the wife? As much as you'd like it to be, it is not sex, men. All women in all studies, in all countries, in all galaxies, rank their number one need the same for unconditional love. They want you to talk to them. Listen to them. Be emotionally close to them. Show them non-sexual affection. Encourage them and affirm them. That's love. Peter puts it this way. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. To be considerate is to love her. It's to be considerate of her needs and meet those. And treat them with respect as the weaker partner. 
I think Peter means that we are to respect that most wives, unless you're the heavyweight boxing, you know, woman champion of the world, most wives are weaker than their husbands physically. And we're to protect them and take care of them. And all this shows love to her. Second, a husband should develop a spiritual friendship with his wife. Verse 7, and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. Our, heir, our wives are equal heirs with us of the grace of Christ. They're equal before God with us. They are fellow followers of Christ. If both of you have committed your lives to Christ, we are to recognize that spiritual equality and nurture our spiritual relationship with our wife. When Jory and I got married, we each said our own vows and uh, we each had one part that was the same, believing that God has brought us together, that together we, can be, uh, be together we can become the people God wants us to be, better than we could apart. We saw that marriage was the process to help each of us become better. In any marriage, flaws you overlooked when you were dating that seemed inconsequential now loom large. We begin to feel like we don't really know the person at all. This presents us with the challenge of loving a stranger, not the person you remember marrying. What if, however, you understand marriage to be a spiritual journey to become the person God wants you to be? What if you expect marriage to be about helping each other grow out of your sins and flaws and self-centeredness? Then when your mate acts differently than the person you thought you married, you roll up your sleeves and get to work. When people first begin to see flaws in their spouses, some flee the marriage. They say, that's not what I signed up for. I'm getting out of this. Other people uh, withdraw. They downscale their expectations. They kind of lower the bar and say, I guess this is all my marriage is going to be. I'm not, I'm not expecting much from it. Other people go to war. They fight with each other constantly. In all cases, one spouse looks at his or her mate weaknesses and says, I must find somebody better than this. But the great thing about the model of Christian marriage that we are to help each other grow is that you can think of the future version of the person to whom you are already married. The someone better is the spouse you already have. God wants you to help each other become all that you can be. How can you help each other grow with Christ? Well, you can pray for your mate. I pray for Jory every day. You could pray together. We pray together every day. You could read the Bible together. You could do the journal together. We've tried as a family to do this once a week. You could come to church together. You could work on changing yourself. One of the myths of marriage is that you can change someone if you try hard enough. I can't change my wife. She can't change me. But I can change me. And God uses changed people to change others. The end of verse 7, Peter says, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. He says, husbands, if you don't love your wife, if you're not considerate, if you don't respect her as the weaker physically, it will hinder your prayers. You will, you know, go to pray, but you feel like your prayers aren't getting above the roof. You'll, you'll go to read the Bible, but you feel like you're getting nothing out of it. I've had that happen. I've done something. Jory's not happy with me, and I go to pray, and I feel like my prayers just bounce off the ceiling. I go to read the Bible, and I feel like I just, I just can't do it. I go to write a sermon, and just nothing comes. Then I come back to her, and I say, honey, I'm wrong. I'm so sorry, would you forgive me? The key to a great marriage is a right attitude towards your mate. The right attitude is to see marriage as something God uses to grow us into the people He wants us to be. Marriage is where I learn to give up my self-centeredness and seek to serve my mate. You say, I don't know if I can do that. Or how can I do that? Or... 
I already failed at that. My marriage ended in smoke, in a divorce. Or I don't know if I want to get married. I've seen so many other people's marriages blow up. Well, here's the good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells us that we are all so flawed that Jesus came to die for us. But we are also all so valuable and loved that Jesus was happy to do so. If we admit our sin and give our lives to Christ, He puts His Holy Spirit inside of us. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to get all of our cylinders firing. It's impossible to make major headway against our self-centeredness and take the stance of serving our mate unless we depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't have the resources you need for your marriage. But with the Holy Spirit, you have the will and the desire to build a great marriage. If you're a teenager, you have the God of the universe in you to help you become a person ready for marriage. If you're single, you have the Spirit's power to prepare you to be married or married again or to be fully uh, fulfilled as a single person. The right attitude towards your mate is to give up your self-centeredness so that you can serve your mate. The problem is that we're all naturally self-centered and do not have the inclination to serve others. But if we commit our lives to Christ, He gives us the Holy Spirit to live in us. The Spirit gives us the desire and the power to push out our self-centeredness and gives us a heart for serving others. So you see, this message is for everyone. Married person, newlywed, ask the Holy Spirit to help you conquer your self-centeredness and give you a willingness to serve your spouse. Teenager, ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and ask Him to help you push out your self-centeredness so that you can serve your mom and dad or your siblings or your friends. Single person, depend on the Holy Spirit to help you push out your self-centeredness and give you the inclination to serve others. That is the only way to succeed in relationships, whether single or married. All right, would you uh, pray with me? Father, thank you for these great words from Peter. It just kind of surprises us. In the middle of a book about persecution and suffering and standing firm in hard times, he deals with uh, marriage. He's so wise, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So help us all to push out our self-centeredness by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can serve our mate or anybody else in our lives. I want to give you a minute to respond, just to pray. Tell God what you heard today, what you want to do. If you're married, how you want to refocus, how you live in your marriage. If you're single, what you want to think about uh, that. So everybody, uh, give you a minute to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for uh, speaking to us through Peter, through your inspired word, how we can have better relationships, a better marriage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.